Great. Uh, hopefully everybody can now see um, yes. my slides. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so great. Yes. Thank you for your time. Um, we've got about 40 minutes or so to take you through reinforcement learning and how deep racer um, autonomous racing fits into that world and makes it essentially practical. Everybody can get going with reinforcement learning using deep racer. Um, and the bar that I use typically is to say, if you've ever used an Excel um, formula, then actually you've got enough prior experience um, to, to start becoming the next autonomous racer. So um, who am I? Um, so just building upon the introduction that Bill gave me. Um, so my background is as a technical architect. Um, I tend to work more at the sort of senior end of things. Um, I tend to lead projects and work between uh, the board um, uh, and the development teams uh, and mostly around consumer facing brands, which of course at the moment with COVID, many of them are highly impacted, which is a shame. Um, but it's good news for you because I have more time to, to give some of these talks. Um, as Bill said, I'm also founder and CTO at Deep, um, and you did get that right. Um, so Deep is a machine learning um, consultancy, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but the reason really why I'm here today is that I am founder of the Deep Racing community, um, and that is a worldwide community of over 2,000 people um, who have tried Deep Racer and are part of the Deep Racer um, phenomena over the last 12 months. Um, and as a result of my efforts there, um, Amazon have recognized me as a machine learning hero. But my goal today really is to impart um, some basic introduction knowledge um, around reinforcement learning and how Deep Racer helps you learn the mechanics around reinforcement learning and puts you on a good journey um, forwards to, to, to developing your expertise. Um, so very briefly, Deep is a consultancy and, and we broadly do strategy. So we help businesses understand how they can apply data and machine learning in particular to grow revenues, optimize costs um, and transform customer experiences. And of course, then that ties into actually delivering solutions. So we're not a technology provider. We work with the best startups and medium large size companies who have got great technology and we put the right components together to deliver a solution for clients. The other thing we do is enablement. So we actually help teams become more self-sufficient. And partly this is through training, partly it's through ways of working and tooling. But the training is actually where we also use deep races. We run, run one day events for customers and um, where we'll get everyone together. Uh, and the goal really is about helping your whole IT team. So everyone, not just developers, not just the guys and girls at the bottom, but all the way through to CTO, um, business analysts, project managers, everyone gets their hands dirty. Um, and it's a really fun day. Enough about that. So um, a little bit background to how I got involved with Deep Racer before we um, dive into that. So once upon a time in a land far, far away, um, London, um, and actually almost a year ago, uh, I went to the AWS summit. Um, and if any of you have been to these summits over the 2019, you would have seen a track just like this um, in the grounds where people were able to get their hands on Deep Racer. The London summit was actually the first summit um, after Deep Racer was publicly launched last May. Um, so actually Deep Racer is one year old um, today, um, um, which is uh, quite exciting. But this is me on the track, um, and uh, this is me trying out my very first model um, um, on a car. And uh, it did pretty well. Um, I managed to get to the top of the board um, for a little while. And at the end of the day, um, I ended up in, I think, fifth position. But in the process, um, Deep Racer TV, uh, interviewed me and everyone else um, and you can see that episode on YouTube if you just google for uh, Deep Racer TV London you'll find an episode with me uh, in there and many others from that London um, uh, program and there's actually episodes from about five or six different races around the world as well as the finals which were held in in Vegas um, in December last year uh, and as I say I ended up in fifth place which was which was pretty fun but one of the things I took away from the day was a, uh, a real sort of excitement that the other people around me who were racing, particularly the people in the top 10, actually very few of them were experts in machine learning or AI. Uh, and we had a really good conversation and I didn't want that to finish. So I took all their contact details, I connected with them on LinkedIn and other places. Uh, and out of that, I set up a little community just to carry on the conversation. And that was the, the breadcrumbs which started the Deep Racer community um, as I say, just under 12 months ago, um, which has now got over 2,000 people in worldwide. Uh, and, I, and at the end of the season last year, um, I was the best overall runner-up 
So um, there were 64 places in the finals in Vegas and every finalist got a, a all expenses paid trip to Vegas to take part in the competition. Um, and as I say, I was the best overall score pointer uh, in there. Itago was my racing name um, on the Deep Racer League um, in the process there. Okay, so what is Deep Racer? So Deep Racer really came about um, by a realization from Amazon um, that actually machine learning can be quite difficult to get going with. Um, there's a real perception that actually um, this is something that only PhD experts can, can do. Um, and I guess in a way, just traditionally, historically, that probably was true. Um, getting together the pipelines and all the different technologies and the data sets um, before you could even start learning the algorithms and the techniques um, was quite a burden um, and did require a lot of expertise. So Amazon asked themselves, how can we actually take away a lot of that pain and get developers to the point where they can start learning about reinforcement learning quickly? And how can they do what Amazon does well and actually abstract away setting up all the environments, all the tool chain, and get you to the point where you're actually seeing what are the effects of different um, um, characteristics in terms of how you can train your model. And so that, that, that set them the nugget of, of goal and they came up with Deep Racer as the answer um, to that. So Deep Racer is actually three things. Um, there is a car, um, which is a 118th scale autonomous race car. And the picture here is actually from the first generation car from, from 2019. Um, Amazon have actually launched a, a new generation one, which has two cameras, stereo, stereo vision and a LiDAR on top. Um, but it's not available to be purchased just yet. So we're still working with these. But actually you don't need one of these cars to take part because most of your time and effort and energy will be spent in the virtual simulator. And that's actually where we teach the car how to drive. Um, and we actually apply the concepts around reinforcement learning to, to get the car to behave in a way that is um, successful for us. Um, at the end of that process, you can opt to then download it and put it onto a car. And that's essentially what Amazon does at each of the summits. Of course, with COVID, um, all those summits have now been cancelled. So actually, the virtual simulator and the virtual racing environment have become even more important um, to that process. But the final and most fun bit um, about Deep Racer is the Deep Racer League. So I've touched upon this already, but um, the second year now, Amazon are running a virtual league. And actually, hopefully, after today's session, every one of you can actually go home and log on to the Amazon platform and start building your models and taking part in the competition. And who knows, maybe you can be one of the, the winners who will get a place, uh, all expenses paid trip to, to Vegas um, in December this year, assuming, of course, we're allowed to meet uh, in December by then. Okay. So what is reinforcement learning? And I appreciate, you know, with AI Camp, there is um, a lot of experts in the community already. Um, so apologies if I'm teaching you things already, but just in case there's anybody out there who doesn't quite know what reinforcement learning is, I just want to give a little introduction to that. So obviously in the space of AI more broadly, um, machine learning is a subset in there. Um, and, and my understanding of machine learning versus AI is AI um, is a way of essentially representing, mimicking human behavior in pretty much any task. And I'll be honest, we're probably quite a far away in terms of getting the utopian models that can actually apply themselves to, to any problem in any situation. Machine learning takes a more specific subset for a given problem. We can develop a model that actually mimics the behavior and probably does better than a human at that, solving that problem, that discrete problem um, in there. Now within machine learning, of course, then it breaks down even further. And there's actually lots of different types of machine learning out there. The three big ones, which most of you will be familiar with, is um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Now, again, uh, forgive me if you already know these things, but um, for everyone who, who's just getting going with machine learning, um, Supervised learning is where we actually have a big data set, um, and these data sets ideally are quite clean, um, and we label the data in there. Um, either, for example, um, tagging pictures to say this is a dog or a cat, um, and then we get a big data collection of maybe 10 or 20,000 pictures that say this is a dog, this is a cat. We put that into a engine like AWS SageMaker, and it will give you out a model, a neural network, that allows you to predict 
give them a new picture, whether that picture is a dog or a cat. Now, if you put in a picture of a squirrel, of course, then it will get confused and it may probably label it as a, as a cat in the process there. But you need big, clean data sets and every bit of data is tagged with the answer. And is that correlation then that the model is learning to predict? And this doesn't have to be discrete. It can be predicting, um, uh, for example, house prices or stock prices into the future um, on a more continuous spectrum. Now with unsupervised learning, we still have big data sets, but we don't label the data. What unsupervised learning is trying to do is look for patterns and, and groups within the data set that says given a piece of data, it is quite similar to these other bits of data. Um, and so uh, uh, as a model, you can use this in interesting ways in that although it won't tell you what that means, if you know this bit of data is similar uh, and belongs to that group, then you can reasonably take action based upon the outcomes you've seen from anyone or anything that's previously been in that group. And so this is good for things like um, Spotify music recommendations where the music taste, the things you listen to, have a discrete pattern and actually by using an unsupervised model we can actually find the groups of other listeners and other songs that correlate well to your listening tastes and then given a new song can predict whether or not that is going to be in the group of songs that um, you're going to appreciate. Now, it also needs a big data set, but as I say, we don't label the data in there, and it will just give you correlations. So with both supervised and unsupervised, we have lots of data um, and examples to, to drive and train our model into the process. Now, if you think of a challenge like reinforcement learning, sorry, with um, autonomous racing, um, the challenge there is how could you create a big enough data set that allows you to actually get every point of the track with every angle, with every velocity, and learn the behavior off the back of that then um, that allows the car to drive. It, it would be a pretty difficult challenge um, uh, to, to use a supervised and more unsupervised model in there. And as I say, that's where reinforcement learning comes to the rescue. So reinforcement learning actually inverts the model. What we're doing is actually building up our training data set as we go along. So we start with no data. What we start with is a simulation of our problem. And we allow something to explore that simulation and learn the consequences um, of doing that. So to make this a little bit more practical, um, the best example of this is like teaching a dog to sit. Um, so when you get your dog to sit, you give it a treat, you're reinforcing positive behavior. Over time, the dog will then learn that actually this is a, um, a good outcome is if I sit, when I hear the word sit, um, I will get a, I get a reward. Even if ultimately you stop giving the reward, the dog will still behave in the same way. And it's the same with, with autonomous car racing and, and reinforcement learning generally. As uh, the agent, as the um, item is exploring that environment, we can actually give it um, rewards to say this was a good thing you did or a bad thing you did. And over time, it then learns to actually reinforce its knowledge about what works well and what doesn't work well and to predict off the back of it. So um, there's some key terms in reinforcement learning that we need to cover just very briefly um, and they all relate to one another. So uh, in the middle there we've got an environment uh, and as I say that is key fundamental to, to reinforcement learning. You need to be able to build a simulation of your problem. Now of course with Deep Racer that is a virtual racetrack, um, a 3D model, an environment where we have um, some of the key characteristics that can influence car performance. So we have friction and basic physics around gravity and things like that, but we don't go everywhere. We, you know, things like air resistance is not modeled because at the scale we're talking about, that really doesn't have a huge impact on the car's performance. But in broader terms, in reinforcement learning, this environment could be anything. It could be a stock market simulation. It could be a, um, a drug um, um, uh, experiment where we're looking at how um, individual um, atoms and, and chemical bonds um, react in a certain environment and whether they achieve um, certain behaviors. So we have an environment, we have our racetrack, and um, we obviously then need something to explore that, and that's your agent. So your agent will explore the environment. Uh, and again, in our case, that's a simulation of a car. And the car has the ability to take certain actions. And um, so these are typically discrete actions. And um, so we can 
steer left and right or straight ahead and we have speed we can go fast or we can go slow or, or somewhere in between so the combination of steering and speed gives us a spectrum of possible outcomes that the agent can take in that environment now as the agent does that we allow the agent to randomly take actions in that environment and as it does so the state of that agent in the environment changes so as it progresses around there it may be on the track or off the track it may be near an edge or not it may be a crash for example if it's hit into an object and um, that's on the track and as it does this iteratively through lots of episodes lots of attempts through that environment at solving the problem and in our case an episode is uh, from the start of racing to the point we crash which could be coming off the track or hitting an object um, it can also be actually to the point of achieving our goal, which is getting a whole lap. So that is an episode. And we do that lots and lots of time, lots of times iteratively over and over again. Of course, this is where the cloud becomes great because we can scale this very cheaply and very quickly um, in doing so. Now, as we get those episodes, as the car and the agent explores the environment, it does different things. And that is where the reward function comes in. Now, the reward function in reinforcement learning is probably one of the most critical things uh, you need to learn and actually is where you're going to spend most of your time um, in actually building models, be that for autonomous, autonomous car racing or for something else. So the reward is just like teaching the dog. So when the car does an action um, that we deem to be a good outcome, then we give it a positive reward. And if it doesn't, we give it no reward. Actually, giving negative rewards kind of doesn't work too well, at least in deep racer uh, environment. So if the car does something we don't like, we just don't reward that behavior. So let me give you an example. Uh, as the car goes around the track, um, we can give it a reward. Um, and so the longer it stays on the track, it will accumulate more reward. And it is then mining into that understanding that if I take these actions, I'll get more reward, that the car then learns to actually see the features of the track that correlate good rewards and the good actions that um, and led to more reward and then over time and um, it gets better so looking at those um, environment from the car's perspective if it sees the track boundaries for example and the features of the image that uh, show a track boundary bearing around to the left and it takes actions one two or three which happen to be steering left it will end up getting around and getting reward and that's the behavior it learns and will then try again on the next situation once it's been rejuked so reward function as i say the reward function is probably the the most important part of of uh, reinforcement learning and so we're going to focus a little bit on um, how that works for deep racer so as i say it incentivizes a particular behavior uh, and it's at the core. So you need to get the right reward um, to incentivize the right behavior. If you inadvertently reward the car for crashing, that's what it will learn to do. <laughs> and so you have to think very carefully about um, how you could structure that. So taking our problem, we have our agent, we have our environment, a track, and we have a goal. Our goal ultimately is to get around the track. And in fact, get around the track safely and uh, in one piece, and in a way that actually gets us around the track quickly. Um, so um, as a human, you can look at this problem and say, well, that's pretty simple, really. Um, you just go straight down the middle of the track and you're gonna be at the, the end. But from a computer perspective, this is quite challenging. Um, if you take you know, your traditional sort of um, functional programming, um, uh, even with libraries um, like OpenCV, trying to actually interpret what you're seeing and code that um, traditionally would be, would be a very complicated and a huge um, program. So with reinforcement learning, with machine learning in general, uh, we need to find a way of actually getting the uh, model and getting the computer to learn the outcome we want to get to and actually find an optimal neural network that gives us the answer we need. So um, reinforcement learning using a reward function over this problem, um, one way we can do it is split the environment up into a grid. So ideally, again, as a human, we can see the most optimum path, the quickest path, is probably straight down the middle, the center line of squares um, from where the car currently is to the finish line at the end. And then if we overlay on this though, any other um, alter alternative to that is gonna take us a little bit longer. So with reward function in this case, and this is obviously a very simplistic reward function, if we gave um, 
two for every time the car is in the center of the track. Um, and we gave point to when it's just slightly off center and we gave nothing when it's at the edge and has crashed. Then we have um, a reward that says, look, you can go where you want to in the track, but I'm gonna give you more reward when you, when you drive down the center. Um, and in doing so then, when the model trains, it learns to correlate that actually the center dotted line is actually probably the feature of the image that's going to give it the best reward and the best outcome. And it's going to try and keep that in the center of the picture. So as then um, uh, the car goes through an episode, and for cool, an episode is um, one experience through the environment that leads to a terminal state, be that a crash or getting to a success. Um, it will randomly take actions initially because it has no experience of knowing what works well. And so in this case, it takes one step forwards and then it takes a step left and another step left. So in this case, it's got a reward of two plus 0.2 and plus zero. So 2.2 is the total reward for that episode. Now, doing this lots of times iteratively over and over again allows us then to experience um, um, what different behaviors lead to different outcomes. So in this case, it's still wobbling a little bit, but it's got a better outcome. It's got um, 0.2 plus two plus 0.2, so 2.4 in total. That's better than that first episode. So that combination of behaviors where it's steered left and then back into the middle earned more reward. And of course, then when you do this over and over and over again, it will eventually find the path down the middle, which leads to the best outcome. And so you see on the left hand side here, a chart that shows as the number of episodes goes on, what is our total cumulative reward? And you hopefully, if you've got a good reward function, will see that curve sloping upwards. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to go up every single step because actually the, the car actively tries to find better outcomes um, and it ultimately doesn't know when it's got the perfect outcome. But as a human, again, we can see it straight down the middle and eventually it gets to a model where we have finished exploring the environment and we can actually start exploiting that fact. As I say, uh, iteratively over and over again, the most optimum path is down the middle. And actually beyond that point, there isn't any more training we can do that will get that model to go any better. So that's the point at which we say the, the reinforcement learning model has converged. It's reached a point where actually you'll see in the reward there and the outcomes levels off. Now, if you trained that for another 10 hours, it's not going to get any better. And in fact, it's probably going to get more uh, uh, badly performing because it's going to get too used to the environment uh, and expect a perfectly straight track in this case. Um, of course, the real world isn't perfect and there's lots of um, their behaviours in there which um, we don't want to get to. So, um, doing that over and over again, you can see the difference between exploring, hopefully this video is showing for you, um, exploring you end up crashing quite a lot because it doesn't really know too much, it's trying to find the best combination of actions to get a reward. Eventually, it starts to converge and we can exploit that to actually get around the track. That's the point we're ready to race, be it in the virtual environment or on a, a physical track. So um, this is taking a little bit longer. Okay. Um, so once you've got your model ready, um, uh, there are essentially two ways you can race it. You can race it in the virtual circuit um, as part of the league. Um, in fact, you don't even have to enter the league. You can evaluate it in your own environment, but it's more fun if you do take part in the competition. Um, and you should have been able to go to any of the summits around the world, the physical races. Of course, with COVID, pretty much they've all been cancelled so far. Um, and we hopefully might get a couple towards the end of the year. But instead of that, then Amazon have switched the summits to be in a virtual summit. And consequently, there's also a virtual deep racer race as part of the virtual summit circuit. And um, either way, there's going to be, uh, I think it's like 78 places and um, prizes where you can win an all expenses paid trip to reinvent um, um, Vegas in December this year. And there's some runners up prizes where you can win one other car. And hot off the press today, um, if you train um, during May, all of your training costs using the Amazon resources and the Amazon console are going to be 100% reimbursed by Amazon at the end of the month. Um, so this is a great time. This is a perfect time to get going because um, there's literally no cost to this. When there is charges, um, it roughly costs around sort of $5 per hour of training. So it's not extortionate. Hey, Linda. Uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. It seems like we lost your screen. Are you still displaying share screen? Okay, now uh, I can see now. You can? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, like 
in the last two minutes, we can't, we didn't see anything. Ah, okay. Apologies. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, okay. Anyway, at least now it's fine. Now. Good. Um, okay. Uh, and in the 2020 race, there is actually um, three um, race formats um, that you can take part in. So there's time trials, which is essentially, um, okay. Um, PowerPoint has just crashed on me. So uh, it's just going to restart. Apologies. Um, Give me a moment. So yes, I say there's three race formats um, in the 2020 league. There's time trial, which essentially is getting around the track as quickly as you possibly can. Um, then there's object avoidance, where um, Amazon puts a number of boxes on the track, um, and head-to-head, um, -head where actually we get two models to race against each other. Um, so they're just different ways of um, getting a, a different experience, because obviously rewarding for one of these is quite different to rewarding for the others. And um, are the slides back on the screen now, Phil? Okay, I'm gonna see. Uh, yes, them. yes. Okay, good, um, right. Um, okay, so the virtual simulator. Um, before I give you a quick demo, um, just underneath the hood, what is Deep Racer? So Deep Racer uses a number of off-the-shelf AWS services. In particular, it's using Amazon SageMaker, which actually trains a neural network um, to give you your model and takes the data. As I say, with reinforcement learning, we are generating data as we go through, um, and that is then fed into SageMaker with the rewards to then learn um, what is the optimum tuning to the model to give you the best outcome. The actual virtual environment is built using AWS RoboMaker, which is a great product for simulating pretty much any sort of physical 3D world problems. It has a good physics engine in there as well. And behind that then, it's using S3 for storing the models and the outcomes. It's using Kinesis video stream, so you can actually see what the car's doing um, and follow along. And um, there's CloudWatch, which lets you get log entries and metrics. And that's really important, actually, to learn how your car is performing, so you can then analyze it um, and then work out how to optimize your reward in your next cycle of training. Um, and that pretty much is the process. You create your model, you define what um, rewards you want to have, what action spaces, what steering and what speed combinations. If you have lots of actions, um, you're going to have lots of choice and the car will have lots of choice to get around the track, but it's going to take the model longer to actually learn what is the best action. If you have too few actions, it will train quickly, but maybe you won't have the right combination of speed and steering to get around on a particular situation on the track. Um, and then the hyperparameters we won't talk about too much now, but there's additional things you can do to tune the model um, to give you better outcomes and, and the way it accounts for the rewards in, in determining what it is. So you build your model, you configure your training, you then train it for a period of time, um, typically a couple of hours, um, you then evaluate it to see how it's done. Um, and that again can be on your own as part of the league. Um, uh, you'll learn from that, tweak your model, and then go through the cycle again and again. And eventually, um, you'll get a model which you're happy with and is racing well. Okay, let's go to the demo then. Let's see, hopefully this still works. Um, so uh, as I say, Deep Race has been designed to take care of all of the heavy lifting for you. Um, so SageMaker and RoboMaker and all the services behind the scenes, you don't need to play with or touch with. Once you've actually got used to what's going on, you can very much lift the lid and start delving into the inners. But day one, you don't need to do that at all. So when you log into the AWS console, um, if you simply search for Deep Racer, you'll find it um, in the list of services. Um, it's only available in US East 1, so make sure you're in that region um, when you're doing there. And the first thing you'll want to do is go to Get Started. Um, I've already done this because it takes about five minutes. I didn't want to waste your time. And um, the first thing you have to do is set up your resources. You click a little button here where it currently shows me Reset. Um, that will set up all the infrastructure behind the scenes. Um, there's no cost at that point. Um, the cost only comes in when you're training. And as I say, for May, all of that cost is going to be reimbursed. So once your resources are set up, um, then you can start getting into actually creating your car, and configuring your car. And that's done in the garage. So you go to the garage, and we can build a new vehicle. So there's a few choices. Um, as I say, the new car actually has a choice of having two cameras. Um, and optionally, you can put a LiDAR on top. Um, now, the LiDAR actually adds quite a lot of complexity to the model and the training time. So I would suggest for your first attempt to get going, just stick with the single camera, no LiDAR, um, and that works brilliantly well for the time trial formats. Um, 
uh, in the bottom then you've got the choice of a three layer CNN model or five layer. Um, the trade off here is with a three layer, um, it will be much, much quicker to train, um, but it may not be able to learn as complicated behaviors um, as it could with a five layer model. So particularly when we're doing head to head racing and trying to, for example, um, learn how to block the car behind us from passing us, you know, that's quite a complicated behavior. But for, for the moment, the quickest, cheapest thing to do is to select a three layer model. It will train really quickly and for time trial, that's perfectly adequate. So single camera and a three layer CNN. Um, the next choice you've got is steering. Uh, and, hey Linda, uh, sorry to interrupt again. Can you yeah. enlarge the font? It's quite small, we barely to read it. Uh, okay, so that's perfect, uh, much yeah. better. Thank Apologies you. For that. Um, so yeah, so, so the, the next thing you have on here is um, your choice of actions. You, it's a discrete action space. And if you think about your neural network, the outputs of that um, will be a, a number and each of those maps to one of these actions. Um, so you choose up front, and once you've obviously chosen these, you can't change these later on. And you can't add extra actions in because the neural network just won't have the connectivity to represent that. So get this right up front. Um, you've got a large choice between steering, um, how many um, um, angles it splits that down into, and the same for, for speed between zero miles, uh, meters per second and four meters per second, which four is incredibly fast. So um, for your first model, do something simple um, like uh, probably five on the steering um, and one meter per second in here. and that will give you as you can see um, a permutation of 10 options that split 30 degrees down into two um, uh, and zero and then for each of those you have a half meter per second and one meter per second because we've split everything up um, click next we can give it a, a, a name so my first car um, you can choose a color and um, the color really doesn't make any difference but um, you can do that and, and there you've got a car. So you can come back and modify this, but as I say, once you've trained a model off it, that model is tied to the car configuration and um, when you first do it. So once you've done that, you can create a model, either from this page by clicking create model, or you can go to your models on the left-hand side and create, create model from here as well. When you get um, first logged in, you'll see actually there are five models in your account, which are pre-trained by Amazon to give you an idea, just to give you, if you want to do a little demo, I'll be, I'll be a little tip for you, they won't perform very well in the races. So don't be hoping you can win just by using those. Um, so let's create our first model. Um, the first thing we need to do is give it a name. Um, this is, uh, uh, it has to be unique, but it's just something meaningful to you. So we'll say my first uh, model. Um, give yourself some description because this is really useful then when you come back to try and work out what did I try that time for that model when that one does really well. So we'll say uh, first model, um, uh, lots of steering, uh, center line reward, or something like that. Um, you then have a choice of tracks, and um, the the current monthly um, track is this new one which came out just today. It is very complicated, so I suggest you start with something simple. And actually, the simplest one is the open track in here. And um, really, when a model trains for a track, it gets more used to that behavior. If, of course, I'm training for oval, and then I try and race it on that complicated one, it's probably going to do pretty badly but it's also going to take quite a long time to train on a complicated track. So just for the purpose of this demo, we'll choose the oval, click next. And then you have the choices of time trial, object avoidance, and head to head. Just to start simple, let's stick with time trial, which simply is the quickest lap you can get around the track. And then we have to choose our agents. So these are our cars and you'll see there's the car I configured just a moment ago, my first car and click that and we can click next. And then you have your reward function. As I say, this is where you're going to spend most of your time and thinking about the behavior you want to reward. If you behave, if you reward the wrong things, the car will not perform. Um, and actually, there's some weird quirks which you'll start learning through the process. And um, with this, though, there are a number of default reward functions which are perfectly fine to get you going. Um, and actually, um, if you go into here and click info, you'll see there's a lot of help information on the parameters. And so you get essentially information about the state of the car in the environment. So is it on the track, for example, or not on the track? How far is it from the center and so on? And you can use these if you want to. The default reward function is a center line reward. And as I say, it's looking for um, how wide is the track? How far are we from the center? And then we can work out actually 
um, if we know the track is say 10 meters um, and we are two meters from the center, then we're quite close to the center um, in the process. Whereas if the track is obviously four meters and we're two meters from the center, we're on the edge. Um, and we can give reward. So if we're near the center of the track, um, so we're in point one of the track width, we give one. Um, if we're further out, we give half. And this is point one. This is essentially exactly the same demo as I had on my slide earlier. Um, you then got some hyperparameters. As I say, these change the way the model gets trained behind the scenes. When you get started, don't worry about them. Don't, don't need to look into them at all. Don't need to worry about them at all. It, when you do want to, you can start clicking into the guide and getting more information. But to be honest, that's probably a session for another day. So leave those for the default. And then essentially the last thing you have to choose is how long you want to train it for. So in this case, we'll say train for 60 minutes. And what that would do then, click create model. It will then behind the scenes go and set up a SageMaker instance for training the neural network. We'll set up a RoboMaker using the track we've selected, using the car configuration, and it will start iteratively sending the car around that um, environment into the process there. But this is going to take about five minutes to set up, so I'm, I'm not going to um, show you that right now. If I flick back to my slides um, in um, uh, sort of predefined, um, pre-built, this is the sort of thing you'll see, and this is one of the tracks from last year, where the car is iteratively going around exploring the track in different ways. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, it does pretty well at this point, um, uh, and, but it's still struggling with that end corner. It's randomly then taken a left turn that's got it around. And that's a great behavior. It's now gonna learn, ah, that is a good way of getting around when I see characteristics of the track going to the left. But of course it's oversteering, it's crashing on the inside. So it's not quite there yet. Um, when you're in there and you're training, what you actually see in the console is um, a view that looks just like this. So on the right hand side, we have a sort of, not quite a bird's eye, but a just behind the car view of the car um, driving around and learning to drive on there. And um, don't be misled slightly by, by what you see in there. Um, it's very easy to think the car's doing well, but actually it's just random behavior. It hasn't really learned. The, the graph on the left is where you can really determine how well things are going. So this, as I showed you earlier, is showing you a few things. It's showing you how is your reward building up over time? And hopefully you see this going from bottom left to top right, which means the car is learning. And actually as time goes on, it's getting more and more reward because it's getting further around the track and it's earning behaviors that is actually um, better for the outcome you want to. Also on the bottom is this red line. This shows at the end of each training cycle, um, it does a test to see um, without any randomness, how is the model performing? How far around on average is it getting? Uh, and it then selects what is your best model based upon the model that got you the furthest around the track. That's the model, uh, the point in the model, sorry, that will be used when we submit into, into the league. Um, and there's a few other fun sort of angles you can get uh, in the process if you're, if you're really interested. So that is a really quick demo, and I appreciate that's quite quick, um, but it is really easy to get going. Um, if you go on to um, uh, uh, the DeepRacer um, website on AWS, you'll find lots of guides and things. There's a couple of links at the end of the presentation which will help you get going as well, but I can guarantee all of you can do this in about an hour, have a model that is racing around the track. Now a little bit about the community, because the community is actually the best place to start. Um, there's a few things to the community. We have um, a Slack channel, um, in fact, a Slack group with lots of different channels. Um, this is a brilliant place, um, and it's actually probably the core of the community. Um, if you go into there, we've got channels on reward functions, on training tips, on getting started, as well as some more advanced bits in there as well. Uh, we have a wiki and blog where we're continuing to develop um, documentation and information and the latest news from, from the environment. I should say, we're, we're well connected with Amazon. We have Amazon um, representatives from the DeepRacer team embedded into the community, helping us answer questions and actually giving us, uh, taking our feedback and giving us insights into what's coming up down the line. Um, we also have built a whole bunch of tools. Um, and we've taken what Amazon have done and made it better um, around analyzing your performance and also by taking the Amazon stack and being able to allow you to run it locally on a GPU enabled machine. Uh, which would save you training costs. But right now in May, as I say, there are no costs. So you, you may as well just stick with the console. And finally, we have a whole bunch of videos on YouTube on our, on our community channel um, that go through these sorts of introductions through to advanced topics on, on anything you can think of. And it's a big community. We have over 2000 members um, and it's a very supportive community. So there's no such thing as a bad question. Uh, and the great thing we see is people like yourselves come in 
and um, you have some questions, some problems you don't quite understand, you get help almost immediately. But actually within a few weeks, most of those newbies become the people helping the next generation. Uh, and over time you become better and better and better. But it's a huge environment. And actually from the 2019 um, finalists, the 64 who went, um, I think in the end we had over 40 who came from the community. Uh, and so far in 2020, all three of the winners so far um, have come from the community. So if you want to do well, come, come speak to us. And we are all over the world in terms of people. This is not localized to, to the US or any particular geography. Um, and there's always someone online and racing. And, and really, as I say, it's a great place for you to connect to the rest of the community, to find people, um, to get answers to questions who've already been there, already done experience the problems you may have had or, or answer the questions that you've learned. We also have a lot of experts, both from Amazon and from people who have been racing for over a year now in, in the process there. Um, and it's just a great way of connecting with like-minded people and, and expanding the skills and the process. We've actually extended the community to also include some of the other AWS um, machine learning products, such as Deep Composer uh, and Deep Lens, um, but we won't cover those in this session today. Um, and the other key thing we do is Eid meetups. Obviously not right now during COVID, these have all been cancelled, um, but um, uh, we have, uh, particularly in London and New York and Singapore, uh, we have been running monthly meetups um, and um, typically getting sort of 50, 60 people. We normally have a track and cars and it's just a great, great way of trying out your models in the real world. So we're hopeful these will restart uh, in due course at some point, um, but uh, watch this space. Um, and so yeah, how can you get started? Um, so first thing to do is sign up for an Amazon account if you haven't already got one. It's completely free. You will need to put in a credit card. But as I say, through May, the cost of Deep Racer um, will be reimbursed so that you shouldn't have any bill at the end of the month. Um, number two, come join the community. Um, head over to deepracing.io. Um, there's a link right at the top that says join, and that will take you to the Slack community um, where you can sign up uh, and come say hi. Uh, and when you do join, you'll probably get a message from me welcoming you to the community and, and saying hello. So feel free to, to let me know you, you found out about it from um, this talk because that's great feedback. Um, and then follow a guide. Um, so there are certainly two ways you can do that. There's, there's the official Amazon guide. If you go to the training website on Amazon, they've got a 90 minute e-learning course which steps you through what I've done in a bit more detail um, and gives you a bit more context on some of the things like the hyperparameters and how they behave. And we also, as I say, on our YouTube channel for community, um, have a whole bunch of videos of getting started in the process there. Build your first model. It, it, you know, the best way of learning is by trying um, and, and seeing how it performs and seeing how it doesn't perform. Um, and then finally, enter the league and win prizes. But don't forget, it's free this month, so it's a great time to get started. And absolutely, the community is here for you um, to actually help you on that journey if you get stuck at all. But I can guarantee you it's a lot of fun. It's probably really addictive as well, but um, um, it's, um, it's a good way of getting your head around uh, machine learning, but particularly reinforcement learning uh, in a much more practical way. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, so I'm more than happy to take any questions from anyone um, about what I've been speaking about. Great, uh, thanks uh, Inda for the great presentation. And we have quite a lot of Q and A questions in, in the Q and A. Uh, can we go through from the top one by one? Absolutely. So let me um, um, get, let's try and get that off of my screen. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can get back to um, Zoom. Okay. Um, yeah. You can <laughs> just click the Q and A. Uh, Q and A. I haven't done this before. Um, Oh yeah, I see Q and A. Right. Um, okay, so let's go through some of these questions then. Uh, okay, uh, I guess I'll go from the top. Um, so Nate is asking, can you write your own reinforcement learning models algorithms from scratch and then upload them, or do you have to use a preset model? If you do them from scratch, do you have to adhere to some sort of API or web deep preset? So um. Through the console, you've got a choice of two different RL models you can use. Um, so, um, but pretty much everyone is just using the default um, um, model in there. Um, you can't, through the console, change the algorithms. But as I say, the community have taken the whole stack and allowed it to run locally. And in that environment, you can do anything you want. Um, so uh, yeah, if you're super keen, if you've got some really interesting 
um, reinforcement advanced models, you're probably going to get a, a good edge over other people because most people are just using the default models. And um, because really, of course, this is about learning from from scratch and building those base skills. So yeah, in the console, no, you just get two choices. Um, but offline, um, locally, you can do anything you want. Um, in terms of executing, of course, it's just taking the output model. And so it doesn't really matter how you've trained it as long as the, the model fits the, the right structure uh, into the process there. Um, okay, um, uh, second question then from um, Nathan here. Do you need to have a simulation environment? For example, what if you wanted to use reinforcement learning for something like dynamic pricing and with reward equals pricing and action being increased, decreased price? And so in terms of, you need to be able to simulate your problem space. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a 3D simulation, a physical simulation um, of this soil. So um, in terms of, um, these questions jumping around now. Um, so in terms of um, doing like a dynamic pricing, um, you could simulate, for example, a web platform and users interacting with that platform and seeing the behaviors and outcomes. But you need to be able to simulate the characteristics that will have a big impact on your outcome. So as I say, in, in the racing, that is friction and gravity. Um, in a dynamic pricing, you need to make sure you've got, you know, for example, does weather <laughs> have an influence on there? And um, for pricing modeling, you may be better for a supervised learning where actually you've got historical outcomes where you know a certain price reached a certain outcome. Um, but there's definitely things you can do with e-commerce platforms where you can plug in one of these things behind the scenes um, and let it learn along the way. But um, not many um, e-commerce retailers are, are willing to gamble like that. Um, next question um, from JP um, Gerber. Uh, you mentioned that the reward functions are a very important part of reinforcement learning. What types of reward functions are used? Um, so the reward function is a simple bit of Python. Um, it can be as simple as one line long. Actually, if you write a reward function that says return one, and the model will actually still learn to drive around the track because when it's on track, it gets a reward. And when it crashes, it naturally doesn't earn any more rewards. And it will take quite a long time and it won't be a fast model. Um, but actually, in terms of reward functions, there are a number of examples given in um, the console. There's more in the community on Slack as well, where people are generally actually quite open. If you Google, you'll find lots of examples. Um, but you know what? The best thing are the simpler rewards. If you've got like a thousand lines in your reward function, you've probably overthought it. Um, the most effective reward functions are ones that reward the outcome you want to try and achieve rather than the specific driving behavior. So thinking about making progress and making progress fast rather than um, you know, the example I gave you about positioning on the track and trying to find a, a default line um, in the process there. Um, in the next question then on here from Jay, uh, in the reward process, it might go on loop as well. How do we control that? Um, yeah, so the reward process generally is a cycle, right? Every time the car takes a step, it calls the reward function, it asks for a value, and that is what's been fed back into it. Of course, you could have a bug in your reward function that puts it into a loop, um, and that's you know, just for some future debug. Um, you would find it pretty quickly because the, the model wouldn't carry on learning, so do keep an eye on it. But if you stick with some of the default examples and keep your code simple, um, you shouldn't really get stuck into, into holes like that. Um, okay, uh, the next question from BK, what neural network topologies are adequate? Um, so uh, in terms of this really, DeepRacer has a network topology kind of predefined. Uh, and really, so the only choice is whether you have three layers or five layers um, up front um, to, to guide that. So other topologies, um, I'm not saying that you're not supported, but they're, they're not really supported by the community because it's not something many of us have actually tried with. But if that's something you you want to give a try, then you know we're more than happy to try and help you in doing so. And um, but generally speaking, uh, the topology, the default one, is the one that everyone works with um, in the process there. Um, next question from Andreas: um, Deep Racer hardware is the hardware still based upon ROS or ROS two? Uh, I don't know the answer to that one actually. Um, I know they have been updating the car for the new Evo. I don't know whether that's still in ROS or ROS 2 under the hood. Um, and so ROS is the robotic operating system that drives the, the context around this. Um, if you come and ask me that question in the community, I'm sure someone will know the answer to that. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't. Um, 
Okay, so next question is DeepRacer hardware. How is it to transfer DeepRacer concept to different um, platforms? Um, so for example, the NVIDIA, Jetson Nano, um, or the Google Coral. Um, so I guess there's two ways of answering that. How well can you take the DeepRacer environment and apply it to different hardware? And how well could you take different environments and apply it to DeepRacer hardware? Um, so actually in building DeepRacer, the AWS science team tried all sorts of different models and, and hardware, including the, the NVIDIA Jetsons, um, and um, they had mixed experiences across those. They ended up on the custom build car that they, they've got. Um, it's not too small or too big um, to make it practical and impractical. So it absolutely is possible. What you have to do though, if you want to run it on other hardware, is you need to get more heavily involved in um, RoboMaker and altering the definition of the model of the car and the characteristics of your actual hardware. That's not something the console supports directly, but actually if you go behind the scenes uh, and use RoboMaker directly, you can actually configure that to do those sorts of things. And there are lots of open um, model libraries that you can plug into that. In terms of bringing other platforms to DeepRacer, I'm not aware of anyone who's tried that. Um, ultimately, uh, it's just a basic um, set of inputs and outputs, um, so it should be pretty doable, but it's not something there's much documentation on how to do. Um, how are we doing for time? Are we still okay? I guess I'll take a few more questions in the process there. Lots of questions. Um, uh, actually, uh, there, are two, uh, there are two questions at the very top. I'm not sure if you uh, missed that. So there are actually quite a few voted for that question okay. at the very, very top. Yep, I just see that. I, I, I did start at the top, but people will keep coming in and answering more. So let's see, it's top one now. Yeah, so I know. It's, <laughs> it's like the order is keep changing. Yeah. Um, Sherman um, asked, uh, I wondered what kind of reinforcement learning algorithms people advocate? I've heard Q learning and some of the, the descendants, the DynaQ, etc., but they are all very similar. Is there a default algorithm that is best or preferable or more intuitive? Um, you know, in terms of more broader reinforcement um, applications, it obviously depends upon the problem you're trying to solve and which algorithm works best. Um, as I say for DeepRacer, um, the, the one that's default in, in the console is, is pretty much what everyone's using. Um, I can't top my head and remind me. Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I don't have any more <laughs> guidance on, uh, on, on the variance of those. Um, I don't think many people in honesty are uh, at that level of, of tinkering and whether it's really about getting people who are just getting started into there. But um, you know, we'd love to have you come and explore that with us in the community if you'd like to. Um, let's see, the next highest question, which I don't think I've answered, was from Rainier. Um, is there some way to do transfer learning from one track to another? I start on the oval and progress to the harder ones. Absolutely. Um, so one thing I didn't show you in there because we didn't have time was at, when you finish training your model, um, you have a choice. You can either, um, uh, well, we have three choices. You can submit it to the, to the racing and the competition and see how it does. Um, you can decide that it just hasn't performed well and you want to start again, which is fine. Um, or you can transfer the learning you've already done and tweak it. And absolutely, you can clone your current model um, you still have to keep the same actions space, as I, as I mentioned, that's fixed, but you can put a new reward function in or improve your reward function, or simply try it, as you suggested, on different tracks. And that will help it um, learn different behaviors and become a much more uh, generalized model. Um, uh, in terms of the virtual racing, actually, you probably want to overfit your model as, as much as that's normally a, a naughty word um, a naughty thing to do for the racing and the virtual racing overfitting um, to particular tracks is is probably the way you get fastest um, but you have to but the transfer from that to to the real world um, doesn't work well you do need to train on different tracks because that gives it a lot more experience and of course the physical track is very imperfect you've got shadows and different lighting and things like that uh, into the process um, but if you start on oval, the model will train very quickly. It will obviously only turn left. It won't have learned how to turn right. <laughs> um, but it's a good place then to actually bring that then to a more complicated track where at least it won't be crashing all the time and it can tweak its behavior into the processor. So yes, transfer learning is very much a part of DeepRacer. Um, okay, so I think I've answered the next couple down here. Um, okay, so the next one I'm seeing in here, um, I'm not going to pronounce that name, but how frequently do you compute the reward function after each step or after every few steps? Intuitively, it seems that if we compute after each step, then we only reward short-term results, but not term, long-term results. Um, fantastic question. So we do compute the reward after every step. 
However, we only learn from the aggregate behavior every n cycles, n episodes. So the default is every 20 episodes, it will retune, re-optimize the neural network and then use that to the next um, 20 episodes. Now in doing so, um, you're right, it, each individual step um, it will have a reward. But one of the hyperparameters I skipped over is something called the discount um, and factor. So this is actually trying to very much deal with the problem you described, which is maybe this individual step is not a great step, but by taking this bad step, it unlocks 10 new amazing steps because we get ourselves into a better position to, to get around the next corner. So the discount factor actually says, how many future steps to take into consideration and we aggregate the reward across those number of future steps in a discounting way. So the you know, nth step away is, is, is a much smaller um, contributor to the second step and the third step in the process. And so actually you, this is one of the things you can tune uh, and the default um, is actually a thousand steps, which is probably too much. Um, but you can set that anywhere between one step and, and, and 10,000 probably. Um, but somewhere between 50 and 100 is, is a neat place to be. And that will actually help the car to learn about longer term behaviors rather than just short term ones. Um, another question from the same person. How do you balance exploration versus exploitation? Um, uh, so you don't need to balance that. The, the car will carry on exploring. Um, um, until it's getting more confidence. And the way it does this is through entropy. Again, one of the hyperparameters you can set is how much entropy or randomness um, the car um, should take when exploring the environment. But as the training session progresses, the car should get more confident. The car should be able to say, I took this action and I expected to get that reward. And um, as it gets more confidence and it does get the rewards it expects, it lowers the entropy, it lowers the randomness and sticks to more exploitation. And um, because then it gets it further around the track into, into new situations where it comes across, I thought I was going to do well and I didn't do well. And it focuses behavior on training those elements. So you as, a, um, as, as the master overseeing this don't need to decide between exploitation and exploration. And um, the model will naturally do that. But of course, once you have got to a point where it's um, finished sort of um, exploring and it's um, got the best it can, um, there is very little point in, in training further into the process there. Um, uh, hi, Linda. Yes. Uh, I actually lost track of which questions you answered, which why not. I think we still have quite a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we are over time, maybe, uh, we can pick a couple of more to answer. Sure. And um, is there any particular ones that jump out for you, or will I just go down? The... I don't know. Maybe uh, uh, still go to the bot, uh, go to the top, and okay. uh, you know some people for, uh, vote. I'm not sure that one you already answered or not. I think yeah. So do I just click answered live? Do I? Um, yeah. I'll click right up on that one. Um, uh, okay. So the next one at the top then um, it says. It appears that from the given example, I think would... you, if you answer that, you can just uh, click dismiss. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I haven't, I don't think I've answered this one. So, um, it appears that from the given example, a car will not learn to drive straight or on the right or left edge going straight, but only middle of the road. How would you address that limitation of the example? Um, so yeah, so the, the example I gave, the reward function tries to keep the car in the center of the track and we're rewarding for being in the center. So we're not ultimately rewarding for turning left or right or keeping straight. The car will learn that actually as the center line bears one way or another, it needs to select the right action to keep it in the center. Um, so uh, you do have a challenge though, which is um, uh, after a while, um, and particularly something like this, the car will learn to start wobbling. It's perfectly safe to stay on the track, but let's start, start to learn if it, I can if I wobble from left to right, I take more steps and therefore I'll get more reward. <laughs> and so it's not the behavior you want to get. And so, and the example of given actually uh, do end up leading to that sort of behavior. Um, but um, you can then obviously enhance your reward function to, to compensate for, for that um, in the process. So let me answer that one. Um, I have done this one as well. Um, so let's see. Um, 
okay, how do you factor into the reward function other complex issues such as avoiding collisions with other cars or sections of the road that are slippery or driving on the edge because there is another car already in the center? Um, so yeah, you can ultimately build a very complicated reward function. Um, in terms of avoiding collisions, the car will naturally learn that behavior because obviously when it collides, it comes to enter an episode. So the discount factor I mentioned earlier means it's not getting any future reward because it collided and therefore it will take it, it will favor actions, even if the, your reward is pretty low on them, that get it around the collision because it will then get many more steps and that will be accounted for in the process. Now that said, in the reward function, one of the things you do have are the locations of the other vehicles and your proximity to them. And so you can actually build a reward that says, if I am within say one meter of an object, then, um, then lower my reward and the car will learn quicker to avoid a collision in doing so. Um, but ultimately, it's a question of trading off complexity in your reward function for the amount of time it takes to, to train the model. Okay. Um, sure, so maybe just one more, I guess then. Um, are all the options, the car, the reward, um, set and leave, or can things be added in and changed at successful training trials? So the, the only thing that's set is the action space. And so that's the steering and the speed because you have to set that beginning because that will then change the shape of the neural network in the process. So you can't add actions in, you can't drop actions. Of course, you can reward against selecting certain actions so the model learns not to select them. Um, but in terms of everything else, you can change the hyperparameters, you can absolutely change your reward function. Um, you, can, um, you can't add sensors and things like that and you have to leave that the same because again, it impacts the shape of the neural network. Um, you can choose the track, you can choose how long you train for. So all those things you can iteratively change and adapt. One thing to bear in mind though is, it is easier to train a new model to learn good behavior than it is to untrain bad behavior. So if you've got a model that's learned to do something which is not optimal, um, you might find it easy to start again and train a new model that has tweaked the reward to avoid that bad behavior than to actually apply your new reward on top of the old model. Um, it's a trade-off. Ultimately, you get more familiar with what works well and what doesn't, but um, that is, uh, yeah, it is easier and quicker to, to start afresh sometimes. Um, okay, so I, I think probably going to stop there in the interest of time. Um, I see there's still a few more questions in yeah. here. Um, I mean, the best way is if, come join the community um, and, and we can do that. I am, if there's other ways as well, I'm more than happy to, to answer some offline. Um, but um, a lot of these questions um, are answered in the community. So if you come along, deep race into IO, uh, click join and um, either ask me directly or, or ask one of my channels, you'll get answers pretty quickly. Okay, shall we um, okay. wrap it up there? Great, great, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, it's a great presentation and a lot of uh, questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So um, again, you know, if you, uh, you can join the community, it's a lot of questions, uh, discussions over there. So um, with that, uh, it's a conclude uh, today's webinar. Uh, thanks again for the great questions. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I hope you have a great learning and uh, hope to see you next time in our next events. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.